Hey, let's take a look at one of the segments of a lecture from R.C. Sproul. Uh, it was posted to Ligonier Ministries YouTube channel a few months back. Is Grace Irresistible Willing to Believe? There really is a difference between Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism. The semi-Pelagian differs from Pelagianism at this point. Let me first say here that um, I think Sproul is uh, presenting the contemporary Reformed view of semi-Pelagianism, and that I, I don't think he's going to be describing uh, the historical view of John Cassian, uh, which I, I don't prefer the term semi-Pelagian. That's a term Cassian never would have agreed with. Um, but I prefer Gallic theology, Roman Gaul, G-A-U-L, or Gallic, G-A-L-L-I-C, Gallic. Uh, I think that's a better term, refers to the geographical area, and not to a semi-heresy, which uh, Cassian would surely have rejected. Remember, Pelagius taught that there was no effect on the human race of the fall of Adam, that Adam's fall affected Adam and only Adam. There was no transmission of guilt or loss of moral power or ability, no real fall to the constituent nature of humanity as a result of Adam's fall. The semi-Pelagian says, no, there really was a fall and that men have become corrupt and that we are born in a state of corruption and that the will of man has been severely weakened, weakened to the point that nobody can possibly become righteous or be redeemed apart from grace. Correct. And at that point, every semi-Pelagian is, is sharply different. Sharply from different. You hear that, Calvinist? Pelagianism <laughs> that says grace may help, but is no way necessary for salvation. Some of and say you have to have grace. Right. But they said that man is not so dead in sin and trespasses that he has no moral ability left. He still has the ability in his fallen nature to cooperate with or not cooperate with the grace of God. And that God gives his grace universally. Okay, so here's the question. The question is, how does man have that moral ability? Is this something that just exists devoid of God's grace? Does not man's moral ability come from God's gracious creative act and sustained by God's gracious creative activities? So there comes this sense that some people want to critique Cassian and others usually through a straw man, uh, or maybe uh, more charitably, just a misunderstanding, that human nature exists devoid of God's grace, and that is not a fair representation. And I'm going to read some passages from Cassian, but let's, let's keep playing the clip here. And it assists every man uh, to making the right decision to come to Christ and to uh, respond to the call of God. That's not a bad thing. So that... God desires to save everybody. Come on now. And gives the possibility of salvation okay. to everybody. But in the final analysis, a person will be saved or not be saved depending on the degree of cooperation of that fallen sinner with the what's called preventing or prevenient grace of God, that grace that comes before the decision. If God offers salvation to everyone, He assists everyone, and some say yes, and some say no. Those that say yes are redeemed, those that say no. I mean, it's more than a the simple basis yes of their weak for will, Cassian. But not their dead will, they perish. Now, let me just say to you that I would say that in our contemporary church and society, Semi-Pelagianism, not Pelagianism. Pelagianism is the view of the secular culture. Semi-Pelagianism is the dominant view within the church today, not the Augustinian view. 
But the Augustinian view, of course, repudiated the Pelagian view in saying that, uh, that, that the debate here is whether man still has some core kernel of moral power to incline themselves to respond to the offer of grace, to cooperate with it, or not cooperate with it. All right, that moral kernel. Uh, again, the question is, where does that moral kernel even come from? What sustains it? What keeps it going? What enlightens it? Uh, it's God's grace. It's God's grace that does that. So I do think it's a, a, an accurate representation to say that there's a, a moral kernel. Uh, Cassian would say that there are seeds of goodness. Uh, but obviously what Sproul is implying here is that that's a bad thing, that there are moral kernels or seeds of goodness that remain. How dare we think God's creative act has a product which is continues to exist even in spite of the fall of man? Uh, to me, that's not a problem at all. And so I would, I'm sympathetic to Cassian's view. But let's get back here to Cassian's view, not necessarily my own, because there are some times where I drift away from Cassian myself but as a historical assessment. Let me read some passages from Conference 3. This isn't even the controversial Conference 13 uh, from Cassian's uh, retelling uh, the teachings of the Egyptian Desert Fathers. This is Conference 3. Uh, so let, let's just take this a few sections here as to how Cassian views the role of divine grace and whether man should be credited uh, with making a moral choice. He says, How foolish and wicked then it is to attribute any good action to our own diligence and not to God's grace and assistance, clearly shown by the Lord's saying, which lays down that no one can show forth the fruits of the Spirit without his inspiration and cooperation. Uh, this is, uh, that's from, uh, let's see, chapter 16 from that conference 3. Here a few chapters later. And this plainly teaches us that the beginning of our good will is given to us by the inspiration of the Lord when he draws us towards the way of salvation either by his own act or by the exhortations of some man or by compulsion. And that the consummation of our good deeds is granted by him in the same way. But that it is in our own power to follow up the encouragement and assistance of God with more or less zeal and that accordingly we are rightly visited either with reward or with punishment because we have been either careless or careful to correspond to his design and providential arrangement made for us with such kindly regard. Cassian is saying here, it is the man's duty to respond. But this is far from the common depiction of semi-Pelagianism, that man can take the first step and that divine grace comes later on. No, it's the inverse here from this passage, that it's God's grace which comes first through a variety of possible situations, maybe even compulsion, and I say that because maybe Calvinists watching might be sympathetic to that, but that there are other options here. It could be, uh, for example, he says, draws us towards the way of salvation by his own act or by the exhortations of some man. So, for example, it could be someone's preaching through which a man is drawn. Uh, okay, so again, it's you get this flip from Cassian's view of where grace comes in and man's obligation is. Let me read from chapter 20 of Conference 3. But it is right for us to hold with unswerving faith that nothing whatever is done in this world without God. For we must acknowledge that everything is done either by his will or by his permission. I.e., we must believe that whatever is good is carried out by the will of God and by his aid, and whatever is the reverse is done by his permission, when the divine protection is withdrawn from us for our sins and the hardness of our hearts, and suffers the devil and the shameful passions of the body to lord it over us. Boy, that seems, I mean, I, I'd like to think I'd get a number of my Protestant uh, Calvinists and uh, Protestant Arminian brothers to say, wait a second, that doesn't sound so semi-Pelagian after all. Cassian is a complex thinker, and he 
does not get the the credit that he deserves uh, as far as his conferences provide a theological framework for divine grace and human freedom. He's frequently brushed aside as just a monk doing monk things. And I, I wrote in my dissertation uh, basically that Augustine is, was also a monk, and yet we don't dismiss him on that basis of doing monkish things. And so, likewise with Cassian, we should take his writings and his arguments seriously. Now, Cassian has a lot more to say. I'm just drawing from three chapters within one conference, which is like a, a chapter. The sections are the chapters are more like sections, and the conferences are more like chapters. Uh, so, conference three has material. Conference thirteen has a ton, but it's really throughout. Uh, there's discussion of divine grace and human freedom and the role play between them. And for Cassian, it's a both and. It's both the grace of God and the free will of man working together. For R.C. Sproul, it's the grace of God or the free will of man. It's that moral kernel. So uh, man has this somehow devoid of God's grace, uh, which is really perplexing to me. That's the... Sproul doesn't state that explicitly, but that's the implication one receives from his teaching, which leans explicitly Augustinian. I mean, he, in this lecture, he clearly says it, so it's not like he's hiding anything. Folks who study theology know that he was Augustinian. And uh, I like to tell folks I'm Augustinian as well. I'm an early Augustinian, and Sproul is a later Augustinian. And that's because Augustine changed his views on divine grace and human freedom. And he notes, Augustine notes this multiple times in his writings. Uh, so even that term, Augustinian, uh, needs to be subdivided chronologically, early Augustine, later Augustine. I've got no problem with early Augustine's writings, which I've read, uh, but I do take issue in his shift of thinking. I think uh, Augustine made a mistake when he changed his mind. And I know my Calvinist brethren are going to say, no, he shift, he changed his views the right way. <laughs> so that's what the debate comes down to. Uh, but as a historical matter, uh, I want to encourage everyone to read John Cassian and to take his beliefs on his own terms. Read the conferences for yourself. You could also read his work Contra Nestorian, uh, and Nestorius and um, see what he says about divine grace and human freedom in there because the first two chapters, Cassian attacks Pelagianism. And so it's, it's a rare time it's explicitly attacked by Cassian. Uh, we really need to do more work on the 5th century Gallic monks because they are frequently uh, misconstrued uh, to laypersons and even church teachers, theologians. They, they don't understand uh, the views of the Gallic monks. And so if you want to learn more about the Gallic monks, subscribe to my channel. I do videos on these, these monks, uh, John Cassian, Vincent of Lorenz, and Faustus of Rees. And if you have questions, write them in the comments and maybe I'll make a video and explain more about what these guys thought.